Hello, happy 2024. Welcome to January. And we're so glad you're here with us for the Integrated Care Podcast. I'm your production editor, Grace Pratt, and I'm joined by our team this morning. We are going to be talking about growth and teams and how teams develop and evolve over time because this year in 2024, we are celebrating a huge milestone at the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association. We're 30 years old, which is incredible. And so we have a lot of ideas of how we want to celebrate that and how we want to, you know, really dig into that and think about our history and where we've been and where we're moving forward. We'll get to that later in our special segment with a special guest, a familiar voice, if you've been a longtime listener. But in the meantime, first, I'd love to have my co-hosts introduce themselves. So I always, you know, start us off with an icebreaker question. And one of the things that you probably should know about me is I love a TikTok trend. I can't stay off of my For You page. I can't stay off of my TikTok. And these days, it seems like everyone is talking about, what do you want more of in 2024? I think it's just the rhyming, more in 2024. And so that's the question I have for all of my co-hosts as we go around. What are you hoping for more of in 2024? So looking around my circle here, first we have Jen Thomas. All right. Sounds good. I'm Jen Thomas, family med and addiction med provider, Morris Hospital in Morris, Illinois, and Director of Integrative Behavioral Health. So more in 24. That's a great question, Grace. I think I will say on the professional development side, just more flexibility and more new growth opportunities for me personally. I'm excited to just take a look at some new opportunities and and keep growing as a provider and really excited about what this year is going to hold for me. So that's my answer. I love that. Lots of exciting things on the horizon. Maybe some you don't even know about yet. My name is Bridget and and, um, the Director of Behavioral Health at Community Health of Central Washington, BHC, uh, in the clinic, supervisor, faculty, all the things. And what I'm looking for more of in 2024 is more weekends at home. Dave and I did a calculation and we figured out that we were not home 26 like weekends out of the year. So, you know, half of our time we weren't at our home and We both figured that that was too much time away and we really value, we really value our weekends at home Uh, in addition to, of course, the travel. So, you know, it doesn't have to be every weekend at home because that would drive me crazy, but maybe just something a little bit more manageable, like maybe like, I don't know, 32 at home and 20 out and about. I feel like it's very on brand for you, Bridget, to be saying, okay, we had 26, we're going to have 32. This is a measurable outcome. This is a specific goal. And <laughs> we are by the numbers. You know it. I love that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and then next we have Monica Harrison. Hello, everybody. Monica Harrison, licensed clinical social worker, clinical trainer and practice coach with the AIM Center. More in 2024. I- Actually, think I need to do what Richard is doing. I need to add more travel. So my plan, personal, professional, what we need to do, but more travel it is. I love that. <laughs> I mean, I know that Oklahoma is not like a big destination. I just, <laughs> but I want to put it out there. We do have some really great restaurants. We have a lot of really nice things to see. The weather in the spring is oh, beautiful. Grace, I have you a do not have room. to. You can come eat. stay with my children mm-hmm. and my cats. You're like, you, you can, can stop, stop right there. Grace. So <laughs> military brat. Cats. So I lived in Lawton, Oklahoma. <laughs> No grace. Yeah. Ain't nobody coming to Oklahoma. All right. I'll meet you. No, no, I'll meet no, you no. at a warm destination spot. Okay. I'm sure you have a great time in Oklahoma, Monica, please. Well, I want you to travel more. Maybe I'll I'll meet you at the beach. That sounds like a better plan here for that. And then we have Neftali Serrano. Hi, everybody. I am Neftali Serrano or Neftali Serrano, whichever way you're able to say it. I'm the CEO here at the Collaborative Family Healthcare Association. I am so glad to be starting this new year with my fellow podcasters here. This is one of the highlights of my my month every month. So more of in 2024, I think like just more friend time and sort of positive family time. I just came from a about 10 day cruise with my my family to half. I'm half Colombian, half Puerto Rican. And this was actually my first time going back to 
back to as if I was born there. I was not born there. But going to Cartagena, Colombia, near where my mother was born, Barranquilla, which is, for those of you who know, where Shakira was born. And so it was such a fun time. It just reminded me of like how important it is to just have those times, especially for me as my kids get older. But yeah, more friends, more family time. Yeah, that would be cool. And I could I could use some more Monica time. I mean, like traveling with Monica would be a blast. Yes. Let's I'm do for that. It. Well, I'm for it. I'll be back I'll be back your way this <laughs> summer. So we'll get to we'll get to see more of each other in person. Yes. Yes. I love it. And I am Grace Pratt. I am the production editor of the podcast, but in my main role, I'm the behavioral medicine faculty at a community based res- family medicine residency program in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and Integris Health. And I am just looking for more love in 2024. I choose a word every year, and my word that came to me for 2024 was love. And so in all of its forms, things that I love, people that I love, places that I love, just leaning into and enjoying that. So that's more love in 2024 for me. I'm so excited that we are all here. I'm excited to talk, to take a developmental perspective, thinking about organizations and how they grow over time. And then to tease our special bonus podcast series later on, our special segment with Deep Creek. People are going to have to wait for that a little bit at the end of the show. But before we get to all of that, Naftali, what are our news and notes? Yeah, thanks, Grace. So the beginning of the year, of course, is everything ramping up. And so we want people out there to know, especially if you're listening to this sort of synchronously with us in the early part of 2024, we've got two big events this year. We've got lots of stuff going on, but our two big events, the you can find out about both of them at integratedcareconference.com. So coming up in April, we've got our spring conference. So registration should be open in a couple of days here. We're, we're recording here at the end of January here, so it should be really imminent registration. So check out Integrated Care Conference for more for that. And then also right on that same site, you can check out our upcoming call for proposals. And that's for our fall conference. It's going to be in San Antonio. Very special conference because it is our 30th annual conference. We're going to be doing a lot of history stuff. But even if you're not, you know, you're not in the CFHA world, you don't know a lot of the history, all that. It is just a great conference for all things integrated care. No matter what part of the world of integrated care, if you work at a community mental health center and you're doing CCBHC stuff, if you're in a FQHC and you're doing PCBH and COCM, if you're doing expert stuff, if you're in specialty settings, doing integrated care stuff, you've got something for everyone there. And as you can, as you know from our team here, if you're a physician of any stripe, if you're a behavioral health professional of any stripe, a care manager, social worker, whatever, this is a conference for you if you care about integrated care. So check out integratedcareconference.com and we hope to see a lot of our listeners there. And as usual, we, we typically record a session at the conference. So if you are a fanboy or fangirl of our podcast, it's a great way to meet us. Thank you, Natalia. I also want to note really quick, as we're talking about things growing up and ages and anniversaries, our first episode of our podcast released in January 2018. So this is year six of making the podcast, which is just so exciting, so fun. It's been just such a delight to me the whole time to be here and to be part of this. So anyway, I felt like that was worth noting as we turn over the leaf on a new year. So I want to transition us to our main show topic because this is something that I think a lot about. It will, so, you know, we, we joke sometimes about the, like, see, the podcast drinking game. And it's like every time Monica said, every time Bridget says contextual interview, every time, like, uh, that that's the main one, uh, let's be honest. But I think for me, it's whenever I talk about systems, whenever I talk about systems and patterns and all of this. And so I love thinking about systems and how they grow and how they develop and how they change. And Deepu has done some really amazing work as the current president of the board and his leadership role with CFHA. Talking about the leadership, the growth of the organization over time and like looking back and looking forward. But I thought we could broaden that out a little bit this week and just talk about sort of the life cycle of teams and how they develop and and how growth happens. 
And so I want to open up broadly, like I often do, and say, what are some of your thoughts about like this team formation and team growth and how teams change over time, whether that's grounded in some personal experience or just observations that you've had, but what are, what are some ways that this happens to sort of kick us off? Yeah, if I can jump in, I'll just say that this is something I've thought a lot about, probably because I am have have the most grays of anybody on the on the call. And so have seen things grow, develop, and reach different stages of maturation. I I'll just tell you like a personal story. So, you know, I, I started two different PCBH programs at a federally qualified health centers and saw them from their, you know, from their infancy. All, all the way through to maturation. And, you know, it, it, I think talking about this grace is so important because I think people think of programs as linear. It's sort of like this thing that, it's sort of like how I thought about growing up. I thought if, when you grow up, you just grow up and then that's it. You, you just grown up for the whole rest of your time. And when I reached midlife, I had my little mini midlife crisis. And I, and I realized, all right, I'm grown up, but I still don't know what the heck I'm doing. <laughs> like, well, I thought I was supposed to have, it, have my shit together by now. Right. And I, and I didn't. And, and that's true of, of, of my experience with programs. Like they're, they don't grow linearly. There's no such thing as a program that, that is finished. And, and, and programs also, and people within programs also go through through natural life cycles. So for me, as an example, my last job as a director of behavioral health at Access Community Health Centers in Madison, awesome job, fantastic organization, built that program. I was the first, I was the only BHC. I started out at, at half day a week volunteering there as I was raising my firstborn while my wife went to met what was in residency and I just was doing it on the side. So I started from there volunteering for for a little bit to to growing it to where where it was a full fledged BHC program with you know I don't know how many postdocs trainees staff etc. and then and then I it reached a part of the life cycle where it really felt like I needed to leave like and it wasn't because things were bad it's it just I really realized this is a part of the life cycle where someone else needs to come in leadership take over things that I'm not necessarily good at and also create space for other people to kind of flourish and, and do their thing. And, and it was a weird feeling to be at that space, but I think I'm so glad I was able to recognize that because I think if I'd stayed, I, A, I would be unhappy. B, the program would be a lot worse off. That program has done so well since I left because there's this opportunity for growth and it just hit that life cycle. It's that idea of life cycle. I think it's it's a really important thing to understand when it comes to these integrated care programs. Yeah, I don't know if that resonates with other people on the on the on the team, but that that's just something I've thought a lot yeah, about. Yeah, I think it definitely yeah, the personal parallels resonates. No, I think it definitely resonates just with the thought process of growing over time and knowing when it is your time to step to the side for someone else to come in and then they have their vision, right? And they take it with their vision. So the thought process that sometimes we're only in certain places for a season and not only for the organization's growth, but for your own individual growth as well. Like there are professional growth that you need to to have and get that doesn't always come from the place that you're in. So what do you need to do while you're there? Get in there, be great, build up. And then what's the next, like what's the next thing? So no, that resonates wholeheartedly with me. You know, I think one of the things that I had sort of hoped for us to talk about, and I love that you started with this parallel of our personal lives, Natalia, because for one thing, I don't know how many times I've looked around my house with my children that I own, that I'm the only name on the mortgage and think, when are the real grownups going to show up? Like, who's in charge of all of this? And honestly, the same thing is true sometimes at work. I'm like, my supervisees come to me and they ask me a question. I'm like, let's ask your supervisor, which <laughs> is me, which is why we need community, right? We cannot grow in isolation as a person, as a professional, like all and all of that. So we need community. We need people to come around us. But we also have to, I, I think part of this growth mindset 
for people and for organizations is recognizing that we're always growing. And one of the things I wanted to talk for us to talk about too is like, what are the what are the pain points? What do growing pains look like in an organization? Because we're taking a little bit of a rosy view right now. Like we're always growing, we're always changing. We're doing what we can and knowing when to step aside and let someone else lead. But it's usually a lot more messy than that in practice. Yep, it is. <laughs> it is. Because I think you have to kind of redefine who you are professionally while flying the plane. So there's a lot of knowing your internal value and then what you bring to the the system and redefining how your contribution is is measured. And particularly for medical providers, there's very, you know, strict fee for service models for that. So when you're doing other growing programs and things, it's really hard to advocate for that piece of yourself to be valued. So that is the message. A huge shout out for Nifta Ole's upcoming book, PCBH Implementer Guide, second edition. I don't know, Niftal, if that was your intention when you invited Dave and I to write a chapter, but we literally wrote painstakingly every chapter of our story that we could recall, because who the hell even knows, you know, our minds and our memories are fickle, but Dave and I did the best we could to cobble it together with the help of some outside folk too, like in our organization outside of the two of us, but I, I'm, I'm rereading it because the, the edits are due January 31st. And oh my gosh, it feels like a lifetime in those nine years, nine and a half years. So yeah, there, I mean, the, the heartbreak, the failures, the fights, there is nothing pretty about it. And there's nothing pretty about it. The, the most I've been able to ascertain is to invest do the right things over and over again and then trust the universe. And it's it's it keeps on supplying. The universe keeps on supplying, you know, sending you somebody right when you need them. But it, to me, comes from the perspective of like, you have to do the right things day in and day out. And I know on brand, not shocking, being very, very intentional about everything we do. And so we literally wrote it in, down. Our, our entire game plan of what we do and how we approach it is found in the final chapter of the PCBH Implementer's Guide second edition. Exciting. That's great. When does that come out, Naftali? Is that a work in progress, obviously? Yeah, so it's a work in progress, but hopefully sometime this spring. Oh, very yeah. cool. Looking forward to that very much. Yeah. And it, I, you know, I really appreciated your vulnerability, Bridget, in writing, because that's, that's the tenor of the book. It's supposed to be a non-academic, just more narrative style to talking about program development, because so much of the stuff out there looks so clean and beautiful. And I hate that because as a program implementer, nothing I've ever done looks that way. It is has so many bumps in the road and, and Bridget and David definitely like laid it out there. And there's a word that you guys use that's really interesting. I hadn't heard it. It's called rumbles. And so, so they, Bridget and Dave talk about like how many basically like points of tension, let's say, there were in, in their relationships in their in their own personal growth and their you know you know as they're as they're trying to grow their program and gain the respect of administration and 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 then dealing with slights you know just feeling slighted sometimes and not appreciated as you're building a program and the organization's doing its own thing and and all of that that's all part of of this and actually Probably one of the more, you know, you can think about, well, I need great, ex, you know, technical expertise in COCM implementation or PCBH implementation. But I think actually the biggest piece is you need to just know how to weather the ups and downs of relationship building, organizational life, life cycles. You need to have wisdom around when to raise your voice and when to just stay quiet and let let stuff just happen to till it all falls apart and then people finally ask you, so how should we do this? You know, there's all sorts of little nuances to, to program development that are not, not really technical. In I did, we did not write this in the book, but I guess we'll share it on the podcast. Yeah, I had never been to counseling or therapy my whole life, even though I was practicing as a licensed psychologist, <laughs> you know, as a BHC for, for multiple years. And I wrote into the chat, which y'all can't see, but I said leadership sent me to therapy because it did. And there were so many things that emotionally I wasn't ready to handle being at the time. I think I was 29. 
years old, maybe 28 when we started and then really started making the decisions at 29 and 30 and everything officially. And it was just like the technical expertise was great. And I'm glad that I worked on that. But the emotional aspects and the relational aspects were a thousand times harder. I feel like, I don't know, maybe, maybe if I didn't have the technical knowledge, I would say that was it. But I felt conf- confident in that area from the start. And not that I haven't learned a bunch of stuff, but I felt confident in that area from the start. The other stuff was a complete meltdown. I love so much that you named that, Bridget, and shared that with our listeners because back to systems theory, you know, there's this parallel process that happens in families where each person has to be working on their own stuff and working on what they're contributing to the family. And I think we see that in teams where, you know, you as a leader were taking up a new role. You were kind of like the new parent of this little baby organization. And that brought out new challenges and new skills for you. And you chose to lean into that and chose to use that to kind of refine your own growth, which I'm positive contributed back to the health and growth of your organization. And I think there's an interesting thing is that, that happens when if we're talking about a life cycle of, of teams and, and thinking about families too, we need some shared purpose. We need some shared direction. We need some organization. And we all have to be, you know, that's not going to be the same for every person ever because we're, we're finding this messy middle. We're finding the ways to come together in our in-betweens and to find our edges and figure out how they piece together. But that commitment to our own personal growth and then how that contributes to the growth of the team, I think is one of the ingredients that keep organizations growing or keep teams growing because not every team has a life cycle that ends with this like beautiful maturity and growth and development. Sometimes things fail and sometimes things fall apart. And so I just really love um, that we've named that at at this point in our conversation. Yeah. In fact, you know, there's a, there's an approach that, that we're using for it's a facilitation method, but it's it's a way to think about program life cycles. So for you to think about as you're a group. And I think, you know, one of the nice things about it is called the echo cycle method. It it, it just assumes that things are going to die. It doesn't like, it's not having you be surprised that something has to come to an end or something has to change. It just assumes that's the way it is. And that's true because that's life, right? You You go from the the birth of an idea and some many of those ideas won't actually you know grow up to be something right if you think about a bunch of seeds scattered on soil some of them will grow some won't and then you have the infancy of some of those ideas and that needs a lot of nurture a lot of energy put into the system for it to work and and then you have the sort of adolescence of that program and a a point in time where it's reached a level of maturity, but still needs a lot of scaffolding, still needs a lot of support, a lot of investment is still growing rapidly and and making progress. And then, you know, you have maturity where, where you have a program that's settled, set, doesn't require a lot of scaffolding. It's, it's pretty consistent and all of that. So, so you have all of that and and then, but then you do have depth. Death is part of the program life cycle. There are certain parts of things that need to die or go away. There are certain parts of things that need to change, things that just no longer are functional or relevant. And, and actually what, the, what that approach makes you kind of more aware of is that things, if sometimes you can have dysfunction in organizations when things are not allowed to die, you know, and it could be a role, it could be a function, it could be a position, it could be a person, it could be a program. That sounds bad. A person allowed to die. You you all know what I mean. Not literal death for the person. But like, you know, so that there's there's that sense of like, no, let's invite the idea that programs have this natural life cycle and invite the idea that there is in in the language of the model creative destruction. That is that is like it's important for things to die sometimes so that you can create space and time and energy for the things that really, you know, need to flourish and and, and need to grow. And I can think of like a bazillion different examples of this in, in my sort of program experience. I mean, there's, you know, there's so many like tech tools we used early on that we, we you know, over time didn't 
need anymore. There's processes that we had that, you know, just outgrew their purpose. And I think, again, accepting that as, as a natural function of program development is, is just a healthy way of kind of working through those, those ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that echo cycle, that infinity loop thing. You, you taught me that at the conference in the fall. I've never thought of program development like that. I think I had the linear mindset, like it was a book or a play where you'd have your beginning, middle, end, and it would be like a finish line. Because I think that's a lot like medical model too. It's like, you'll go and you'll be the doctor and you'll be on the plateau and hang your shingle and do your thing. And it's like, no, no, there's many cycles of tear down, build back up. And that's been really helpful to, for me to just kind of think through things in that, that way that, right, destruction and rebuilding is normal. It's been really good stuff. Well, it's the thing to, because things, as we talk about evolving, right, like the way that organizations will need to evolve as the way healthcare evolves, as all of these other things are coming up and and we're like, we have to transition, I'm sure. And I think actually I've had this conversation, maybe it was with Deepu or someone else about, like, I'm sure if we go back and we talk to the individuals who first got together and thought about CFHA, I'm sure there's things that are happening now they probably will have never thought. And there's probably also things that they're like, no, we want to hold true to this, that they had to let go because we are evolving, right? And so I think it's the same thing that we will eventually have to come to terms with as we think about healthcare, not just be within four walls of a clinic and, you know, all of these things. Like we too will have to eventually let go of some of the things that we have fundamentally held on to to evolve with how things will change and grow. It reminds me of Simon Sinek's work, I think it's the infinite game. He talks about the infinite values and having that be your North Star. And yeah, if creating contextual and compassionate healthcare for communities to flourish, that might be the infinite value, but how you get there might look different. And it should look different as things evolve. So that that's a really help helpful book in my opinion, if folks want to check that out, I think, yeah, it really puts exactly what y'all are saying into context of the goal isn't having 100 PCBH visits, although that's great and it's awesome. The goal is to make a better community. And so if you could do that in a different way or it needs to be in a different way, then that's where it needs to go. Yeah, and there there are so many parallels in in all of our life life experience around this where roles significantly shift i'll take this personal again you can obviously you, you can tell i've been thinking about this part a lot as a dad of teenagers but like when your kids become teenagers especially older teenagers and i've got one in college and one on the way like you realize i'm i'm a no longer the dad of little kids my role is shifting and I'm entering into uncharted territory. What, what does it look like for me to be a dad in this space, right? Is way, way different. And that involved bo both loss, right? There's a loss of like, I don't get hugs for my little ones like I used to. And I'm not as important, or at least they say I'm not as important to their lives as, as I was. And, and, and it also accepts, it also in includes new possibilities, right? And it includes, you know, new, newly formed relationships with adults or young adults. It includes the opportunities of getting to know their circles, their social circles that they begin to create on their own. Those transition points are part of life. If you hold too firmly to a particular identity, whether it be for yourself or for your program, you you will try to you'll be avoiding the loss to your own detriment and the program's detriment, but you'll also be avoiding those new possibilities, those new that newness that that that's there for you to to grow into. And so I think I think understanding that from a program development standpoint is is really crucial for you to be able to process those as they come and help your teams process those. Because somebody has to say that stuff out loud. Somebody has to say, yeah, we're, we're going through this and, and this is okay. And there's going to be some things we're going to lose and some things we're going to gain. 
but we'll come out better for it. And that, that I think is what true leadership is. It's being able just to call out those things, normalize them and accept them and help move people forward into a space where you can, you can grow and begin to flourish at that N next Nathalie, place did in, you, your, in your program. When you realized that it wasn't as functional for you to continue to stay at the place that you basically built or places, were you able to identify a few folks on the team that you thought would be, you know, a good successor and kind of make a more intentional plan? I, I always feel like that if, if and or when, well, probably not if, but when, but that time, hopefully not soon, it comes at CHGW, that I'd be very intentional and respectful about how I would go about that. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that, you know, again, if you're, if you're attuned to what's going on with your program, at some point there'll be the, this disquiet within you. That's what I felt, a feeling of disquiet. Everything was great, but internally there's this disquiet. And so I paid attention to that and I realized a couple of things. One is just there were people under me who were fantastic, who deserved opportunities to lead. And I had created a bunch of different opportunities for them, but it, it just felt like there's people under me that, that deserve that opportunity. And that was part of disquiet. Part of it was also there are things that this program needs now that I'm not as good at. I'm, I'm a lot better at like the start from scratch, build something, mess around, experiment, grow type person than, than, than a person who works well in something that's pretty well established and just wants to, you know, just, just work within the box, work within the, the, the box and, and the lines. I don't, I don't. I don't do as well in those sorts of situations. And so I realized that there were certain things that were needed. And just listening to that disquiet then, you know, let me have a lead time of about, I would say, a year and a half, where I let my CEO know, hey, about a year and a half or so is when, when uh, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to take my next step career-wise. And, and then we put our heads together around a process of how to kind of do that in a way that was honoring to the team and to, and created a, a true opportunity for leaders who wanted to step up. So it wasn't just me naming someone, it was actually the organization choosing it and those people, you know, sort of putting their name in the hat for that. So it was a process that, that I think was a healthy process transition wise for the team because it wasn't like, oh, Naftali picked someone. I didn't pick anybody. The organization picked with the team's consensus. So I think that that really made for a really healthy transition. And, and it's, it's just all borne out to be true. I mean, the, my successor is, is there now to access ex Elizabeth Zeidler Schreider. Is, is, it was a postdoc. I, I trained her as a postdoc. I forget how many years now. But she stepped into that role and she has done like fantastic things, not just within the organization, but with the state. She's advocated for FQHCs in the state. She's advocated for COCM code. She's, she's advocated for other things related to PCBH regulatory stuff. Like in, in she's grown it in ways that just I know she, only she with, with her skill set could have done. And that, that's just intensely satisfying then to see actually a program grow beyond your wildest dreams without you being there. 18 months, bless you, because... That is not normally what happens. I gave the 60-day piece out, which is probably still more than, than some people, you know. And I think I did not feel any kind of way about that because one of the things that I do believe in is that you should invest in people. And, and not just like mentoring, it like goes beyond that. Um, and knowing the, the staff that you are helping lead, what their interests are, where their strengths are, where you could push them where they're trying to kind of grow and go. So when I left, I knew that there were capable people if they wanted to take on the challenge, right? Because then, you know, everyone has to make that decision for themselves. And there ended up being one person on the team that stepped up and then they found another person from outside of the organization. But I do think that it's important, even if you're not thinking about transitioning from your your current organization that you should be investing in the people who you are leading and helping them to grow in whatever way of what that looks like and what they're interested in and sometimes that means even beyond just your day-to-day -day work 
you know, kind of coming out scale, bigger vision, bigger picture. And one of the things that I have found to be, I'm continuously having to go back to this, even now as I have personal life transitions, is that amount of acceptance as you leave and you transition to be able to appreciate the good part of whatever that journey was that you're coming out of, appreciate it for the good part for what what you have learned and how you have grown and not to focus on the, you know, it was 51st States or we didn't get to do this or having to leave because of this, you know, just appreciate it for the good part of it and being able to just kind of revel in that as you go about to the to the next phase or the next journey. This conversation has been so good. We're coming to the end of our time, so I know I need to wrap this up. You know, I can't walk away without thinking about some pearls or takeaways that our listeners can take. I just really struck by this conversation today in terms of thinking about just even understanding that there's a life cycle of organizations. And I think it was so helpful to hear from everyone about how you think about like stepping in and stepping out of things and knowing when it's the right time um, and thinking about those pain points of growing, that there's that maturity that happens and finding the ways to be on the same page, even as we learn to adapt and what to hang on to and what to let go of. Uh, This has been such a rich conversation, but now I need to pivot us to our special segment. So Deepu hopped on the mic with me to discuss that project that I teased earlier that we're really excited about that we are calling Coming of Age. It's going to be a bonus episode series that releases right here in your main podcast feed in between the monthly episodes this year. And let's listen in to my conversation with Deepu about this, the plan that we have. Hi, Deepu. Good afternoon. Whatever time it is, they're Whatever. listening. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited that you're here. Thank you. Yes, I feel like a big part of my life has been missing. And uh, that definitely is being with the team on once a month. And so I'm very, very happy to make this signed segment possible. Well, it feels like a big pa- part of the podcast has been missing, so it's very full circle together. I wonder if you could catch our listeners up on some of the things you've been up to in the last little over a year since you were with us regularly. Yeah, lots of things have happened. The most exciting thing I really feel privileged to be involved in is being part of the board of directors and serving as president over the last year. And uh, so far, we're all good. So that's, you know, uh, good news up front. Uh, We are very excited for this year. And this is something that Naftali and I have been thinking about for a while. And then, of course, the board of directors have been thinking about a while is uh, this is our 30th year, 2024. It marks our 30th birthday. And so whatever adult milestones that you can think of for individuals, just kind of scale it up organizationally. That's kind of where we want to think about who we are and knowing ourselves in that process. And part of the way that I've been uh, thinking about it is really framing where are we currently? Can we take stock? And I feel like we as an organization, not as integrated care, but as an organization, has a certain level of consciousness in historical memory now that we can respond to our own growth in a meaningful way. And at the same time, be a kind of an instrument or an agent in uh, responding to and shaping and holding this amazing energy that is called integrated care that is proliferating in multiple ways across the country, right? And and probably across the world. I don't want to limit it to just uh, the United States because we one of our board members is from Canada and she's doing fantastic work. And we know Patty and Kirk has done this insane amount of work in New Zealand. And so so at CFHA as an organization is pausing to take stock of our 30 years while mindfully anticipating uh, the future that's coming ahead of us, right? So that's one of the big exciting things that are happening in the world of integrated care for me because a lot of my energy has gone there. We're also doing a strategic planning session and the strategic planning really focuses on imagining CFHA's growth for the next three to five years. We were fortunate to have an amazing roadmap that was directed and created by 
uh, Andy Valeris, and uh, he was our former president, uh, great colleague, great mentor. So Andy has gotten us to be very structured in 2020, and in 2024, we're kind of revising that, and the board is diligently involved in reshaping that, right? And so re-editing that and moving that forward. Um, I'm sure it's going to surprise you, Dunn, that I love this idea of this developmental perspective of CFHA. And as we've been talking about reflecting, like, what does this mean for, you know, the podcast and the different conversations we're having, just... You know, we're always going to be systems thinkers, and I think a lot of our listeners and so many of our, you know, all of our our members of our organizations think in terms of systems. So thinking about that growth and development, and then also relationships, like who are the people? Because this organization is not just, you know, a bunch of non, you know, descript parts. It's people, and there are people that we that we look to, that we care about, that we have relationships with. Who have forged this path and you know we are talking right now about the history of cfha but then that's really inextricably linked with the history of integrated care and when we look forward for you know what we expect and want for cfha in the future and as you were sharing with me some of the ways that you're conceptualizing that with the board it also is what do we want looking forward for integrated care so i love this idea of like this repetition and these repeated connections between people, between history and present and the future, and just different ways that this has been expressed in our larger organization. Yeah, I think relationships characterize everything in the level of passion and investment and the trust uh, that people had for each other probably helped us thrive and survive in the most difficult of spaces. And one of the humbling things that I did last year was really try to do a very imperfect read of our history. I'm not a historian, so I just want to put that, you know, a little disclaimer up front before I say this. And uh, the, the, the cast of actors that stepped in at different phases to help us thrive is amazing. I want to actually go back to the, the single person that I think I don't think many people will contend with me on this. And if they do, please let me know. Don Block, and we have an award named after Don Block. And I didn't know much about Don Block and his details until much more recently in the last few years. And I found out last year that Don Block invested more than $25,000 of his money at different points to make CFA2 work. One was a award that he received and then the other one was literally from his his savings or his account right and so people and around don was all these folks that made the energy very palpable and i would say disruptors right they were willing to disrupt something that was status quo and they were dissatisfied with the way things that were going and some of the history conversations that we've had Talk about CFHA conferences, not in like very glamorous hotels and locations like we have now. I think they talk about like just in a boardroom, no like con breakout sessions. So I feel like we're just like a ragtag crew that really made it happen over the years. And what remains, I think for me as a primary character of who we are as a community is we are very grassroots. And we're very community oriented. We're really good at bringing people in. And I think that is our secret sauce and kind of making this passionate community year after year work. And it's reflected in our community conversation series that we've been doing for the last couple of years. It's reflected in the many special interest groups that have developed over the years. We were thinking of some partnerships this year, and we were trying to figure out how to make it work. And I remember kind of reflecting with Neftali that one of the things that we're really good at is gathering people, right? Like we can get people gathered and we can get them revved up to do the work that we need to do. And so that is what we bring to partnerships and, and, and structures and all of that. So yeah, people, relationships, sacrifices, passion, and a spirit of community, I think is who we are. 
So we were talking about how you and I have a, a little bit of an interesting perspective, I think, because of just the position where we are in our career and the time where we are. So we both started the same year. We both started in 2014. So we're at our 10 year anniversary, just as like practicing professionals in the field. And so we only know you know, from our lived experience, this last third of the time of CMHA when we're talking about these 30 years. And so we have been cooking up a project and I'm excited to kind of tease it to our listeners a little bit, but a way to capture this history and these relationships and these innovators and all of this disruption, exactly what you've talked about. And so DPU and I are working on a little bit of a plan of some bonus episodes. It's still going to come out in your regular podcast feed, but we have just begged, not begged, it didn't take a lot of begging, but we have influenced some of these founding names, some of these people. I was talking about this to a friend of mine just out of my own excitement of the project. I was like, these are the people that I studied to get my comp exams for my PhD. Like, these are the people, right? These are heroes in our field and heroes in our organization. And so we have invited them to come tell their stories to help you know, let us in on a little bit more of the history of those backboard rooms or of, you know, whatever was was going on in the context of those pivotal moments of change so that we can highlight those things and enjoy them kind of together as a community. Because again, as systems thinkers, we see everything is happening in cycles and we look back so that we can look forward and we honor you know, the, those sacrifices and those contributions of these innovators so that we can like look forward to the next 30 years of CFHA, the next, you know, years of innovation. And so that's kind of the project that we're working on that we're really excited about. And what else do you want to say about it, Deepu? Yeah, it is. I think I love what you said about we look back so that we can look forward in an informed way and relationships and people they serve a function, right? They allow the character that we have today. And so we're excited to see if we can capture that process in a pretty organic way, right? And I don't know, Grace, do we want to tease the structure or do we want to kind of leave that as like a, as a mystery for the first episode that releases? I don't know. In their own voices, maybe we'll say that as a, a structure that people could look forward to. Yes, yeah. And the, the, yes, a history of CFHA as told by the major individuals who were around to witness it and experience it and live it and contribute to it. And we're going to, they're, they're who we came after. So we trust them. So we're going to give them, we're going to give them guardrails. And we're going to give them some prompts. And the magic, I think, they'll bring. We have no doubt about that. And then Grace and I will somehow fit ourselves into that. And so that's kind of what we're thinking about. We've teased a couple of names. One of the names that you kind of felt an affinity towards was the idea of coming of age, honoring the history of CFHA. Is that fair to say? Yes, definitely. Okay. So that's... That's what we're going with. That's what the project is titled for now. <laughs> uh, based on feedback and other things, um, we may change it or keep it. But I think that I like the sound of it a lot. I like it too. I like the idea of our growth and telling our stories and looking forward to the future. Uh, I am, I'm just super excited about this, DPU. I'm excited to be collaborating with you. I'm excited about the, the people that we're bringing on board. I think our listeners are going to be really excited too. And so you can watch for these episodes. They should be coming out every month in between our main show episodes. So they'll be in your podcast feed as uh, special bonuses across the course of the year. And then in October, when we meet together for our anniversary conference in San Antonio, you can expect our, our live show in October, you know, our, our from the conference show. And then in November, we're going to wrap up the whole thing with a, we're going to rope Deepu in to come back to the main episode and really think about looking forward and the questions that we, you know, the, the lessons we've learned and the questions we still have to grapple with as we move forward into a new stage and a new phase of, of our organization. So I'm so pumped about this, Deepu. I'm so excited to get to work with you on it. Yeah. And I want to invite the listeners, if you have like specific themes or things that you really want to know, 
Uh, you still may have a little bit of time to kind of like send that to Grace and myself so that we can include those themes. And if you're, we have a burning desire to know certain things in our history and pivotal moments, let us know. And we'll in the show notes add some historical perspective. I have an article as part of the columns that I write called Contemplating the End of Integrated Care. But this is a scary thing to think about. Uh, but we must think about our end in order to live more meaningfully in the present. And so that's kind of the framework that I evoke. And I paint a rough and perfect history of who we are. And hopefully that will inform as you walk into most of our episodes this year and as you walk into San Antonio next year to see us in person. Well, I thank you for joining me today, Deepu. Thanks for conceptualizing this project with me. I'm super excited. And to all of our listeners, I can't wait for you to hear. Thank you. We'll see you soon.